Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically about the newest tome, released October the 21st. And all the juicy, juicy lore that was contained within. The stories that players can unlock over the course of Tome 5, Unleashed, pertain mostly to three characters. The survivor Nia Carlson, Max Thompson Jr., better known as the Hillbilly, and Talbot Grimes, better known as the Blight as well as some more story content about the reclusive figure known as the Observer. But before we talk about the stories, I just want to say something about the actual rift challenges and rewards that came with this time. The items on the free rift track were sadly quite limited, as we were kept to a tuxedo for Ace, a boggy marshy skin for the Wraith, a cheetah print skin for Meg, and the community-made Wraith-themed Never Stop Slashing Legion skin, as well as the Butcher's Harvest Knife Hammer for the Hillbilly, the Guarded Landings trousers for Nia, and a small collection of charms related to Adam, the Clown, Nia, and the Hillbilly. However, for the 1000 Auric cells you could pay for the whole ref pass, the offerings were rather more substantial, as a pay battle pass should be. I actually did buy the pass, because I was absolutely enamoured with the Celestial Salvation Plague skin. Especially since you hadn't gotten a full new outfit, since a disappointing Hallowed Blight outfit last year. I was confident I'd be playing enough to get the full rift and refund the auric cells I'd spent on it. And at time of recording, I have just finished it. I was also a big fan of the new skins for the Hillbilly, the Clown, and Adam. So those very much icing on the cake that encouraged me to get the pass. My take on this rift was largely the same as my takes on previous rifts. If you're going to be playing enough to complete it, there's basically no reason not to get the pass, since completing it refunds its own cost back to you. But I wouldn't recommend buying it if you're an occasional player, unless something specific takes a fancy that you really want to grind for. But you guys aren't here for my shitty takes about Behaviour's Bizarre Battle Pass system. You're here for my shitty takes about the lore that acts as window dressing for Behaviour's Bizarre Battle Pass system. Most tomes consist of two survivor stories, two killer stories, and one story about the Observer, the guy who searches through the memories of other residents of the Fog and curates tomes from those memories. Tome 5 has marked the only tome since the first one that has broken this formula. While it did cover stories of two killers and the Observer, it only covered one survivor. I have some theories as to why that might be, but I'll cover that in full later on. I'll be reviewing these stories from worst to best, starting with the bigger disappointments and building up my enthusiasm over the course of the video. So, let's get cracking. We'll be starting this tome review at the bottom of the barrel, with Rebel with a Cause, starring everyone's least favourite Swedish graffiti goblin, Nia Carlson. Nia's base lore has always been pretty unimpressive and kind of sparse, with the core of her character largely being that she's just quite unhappy with her situation, and rebels in her own way through graffiti and street art. I always found this to be a little unsatisfactory, as it was never too clear about what about her circumstances was so objectionable to her, or how her graffiti habit helped solve her problems or validate her feelings. It's clear that the person writing these stories was aware of the gaping hole in Nia's character and tried to fix it in this story, as the title Rebel With A Cause would suggest. But honestly, I'm not entirely sold on Nia's supposed efforts to benefit that cause. Or rather, I'm not sold that she's the person that we should be caring about here. I must say first, credit where credit's due, they did at least not lie to us. They actually did decide to make Nia a rebel with a cause worth fighting for and it's a relevant one that we can all understand. There's a very clear villain in Nia's story. The local politicians and corporate tycoons who have damaged their city's water supply and destroyed the lives of its most vulnerable citizens through mercury poisoning. As inequality surges across the world and corporate greed tightens its grip on our day-to-day -day lives, this is the kind of thing that resonates with people and provokes a strong emotional response. This is an excellent cause to get behind. And during my initial read of the story, I was genuinely impressed and hopeful he'd be able to turn Nia's law in a better direction and give us some real purpose. But Behaviour made a classic blunder here, that's very similar to the one that they made in the Hag's Tome story, which I've gone on record criticising extensively before. They forgot who their main character is supposed to be. Because Rebel With A Cause is not about Nia's activism, nor about her being ready to put her life on the line to burn down the establishment and liberate those in need. No, nothing so... decisive. The one participating in this direct action to help her community is actually her friend Casey. Nia's role in it is mostly just a monologue, where she eventually decides that 
giving a shit about other people might be a good idea, actually. Casey's the one who actually does stuff, who has all the ideas and frames the wider issue at hand, the poisonings, into the story, as well as providing a solution and forming the story's emotional centre, while Nia is a bystander, a side character, in what's supposed to be her own story. If this is starting to sound familiar to you, good. You see my video about the Hag's Law and why it sucks, and if you haven't watched that video I suggest you do so, because just as the Hag, known in the story as Lisa, took a back seat in her own narrative in favour of her bitchy and freshly deceased friend Pam, Nia becomes almost totally irrelevant in her own story, as Katie's personality shines brighter than Nia's ever does. Casey makes a really, really strong emotional argument for the liberation of the vulnerable and direct action against their oppressors, but Nia should be the one doing that. How are we supposed to believe that she's some revolutionary iconoclast if she's pretty blasé about the whole thing, and only really gets her arse in gear when her friend tells her to? And it's not like the end result of Nia's work is particularly impressive. Casey spends her time from the very start of the story giving out water to those in need, visiting the sick and doing her best to make things right. What does Nia do? She spray paints the mayor's car and then skateboards away like a Swedish Bart Simpson. Maybe I'm just being a cynic, but compared to what we see Casey do, Nia's actions just seem lacklustre and kind of meaningless. Give me one good reason why we should care about Nia instead of Casey. It's not like behaviour's given us a good one. She actively makes fun of Casey's idealism at the start of the story, and gets zero emotional depth for most of it. Which just makes the attempt to shoehorn in some evil art teacher at the end even more pathetic. Why would Nia, someone who's supposed to be anti-authority, listen to the criticism of a pig-headed art teacher? And if this art teacher is so important to Nia, why haven't we heard about them till the very end of the story? It feels almost insulting that Behaviour thinks this is good character development, and that we're supposed to swallow it. Nia's character isn't enriched with Rebel with a cause. The only thing that makes me feel is upset that we didn't get a more interesting survivor, like Casey, instead. Speaking of things that weren't what they could have been, let's talk about Doors Unknown, the story starring Talbot Grimes, better known as The Blight. This story marks the first of its kind, in that it's re revisiting a prior killer. The Blight is the only character, apart from the Observer, to ever get more than one archive story starring him, since he was the point of view character in the Hallowed Blight story The Hunger back in 2018. At first glance, I was fairly impressed by Doors Unknown, as its language and imagery is beautifully disgusting, as an exploration of Talbot's addiction to pustular serum, especially given the context of the opium war in which Talbot was involved. Presenting everything in the story is one giant drug fueled hallucination that unravels Talbot's mind for us it was a really creative way to frame the whole looking into the memories thing that makes up the archives. The Observer literally probes the Blight's broken mind and displays it to us here. But there's a few things holding this story back from being as good as it could have been. And the first question I have to ask is what does this story tell us that we didn't already know? We know that the Blight was involved with the Black Veil, the cult that worships the entity on Earth. We know that the Blight's desperation for more pustular serum has damaged his body and mind, and that he'd do anything for more of it. And we know that he feels guilt for all the lives he ruined working for the East India Company. That's really all this story has to tell us. Which means all the beautiful, flowery language is ultimately telling us nothing at all. It's a waste especially given the context of the story it's presented in. This tome had fewer stories than the tomes that came before, apart from the first one. And with the reduced number of stories, I would maybe expected to see longer stories with more revelations to compensate for that. But between the blight being a killer we've already had a story about, and the total absence of new information that this story provides us, I can't help but feel this slot could have been put to much better use. The presence of charms, outfits, and riff challenges for Adam and the Clown suggests that maybe there was going to be Adam and Clown stories in this tome, but for some reason they abandoned that and gave the Blight the spotlight instead. The reason behind this lies in the skin releases for this Halloween. The Blight received his true Blight's Halloween skin this year, and the Doors Unknown story 
details his transformation into the true blight. On one hand, I like how they're tying the Halloween scenes into the lore of the game, but on the other, I just wish this story had a little more substance to it, especially since we gave up potential stories about Adam and the clown for it. That's where my dissatisfaction with this story comes from. It's not that it's a bad story, it's a perfectly pleasant read with some beautiful language and imagery. It's just that it's uninformative, and what could have been one of the best stories in any of the recent times has become just another missed opportunity, one that we lost two potentially excellent stories to. This brings us to the first story of the tome that I unambiguously really liked, the Sanitas a Leonis, this tome's little section detailing the observer and his activities. These have become staples of the tomes ever since their inception. I'm always glad to see these little slice of life segments about everyone's favourite beardy boy trying to do his admin work in the world's longest quarantine. I would relate to that, but I can't grow a beard for the life of me. This story is probably my favourite of all the Observer passages, since you get an impression of just how maddening being stuck on your own in the realms of the Entity would be. For most of the Observer's story, he's been leading a fairly simple life, drinking whiskey, hitting golf balls on the roof of his tower, when he's not pouring through the memories of the Fog Dwellers with the Auris. It hadn't been easy for him, and he was still worried about the killers breaking into his archives one day, but overall, he seemed to be fairly stable the way he was. The Sanitas a Leonis completely flipped the script on that. For anyone who knows anything about Latin, even the name should be a red flag that all is not well with the Observer. Sanitas a Leonis means the sanity of Alion in Latin, suggesting that the Observer's real name is Alion, and his mental state is extremely fragile or at risk, and the story as a whole follows up on that promise. The cold open with the dead bodies on the roof and the gory 9-iron is a hell of a shock to the system, as the Observer doesn't even seem too alarmed that he's mentally conjured up images of people he used to know, only to bludge them to death with a golf club. And Alion was apparently keeping a journal about how he tortured these people to death. Alright, sure, as you do. As I read these passages on and on, a single word jumped out at me. The word is... Madness. This story shows us what happens to a man in a world ruled by a transdimensional god of pain when he's on his own long enough. Disfigured bodies appearing in his study with no explanation. Squid-like monsters like something out of H.P. Lovecraft's notebooks rampaging through his archives. Formless creatures fighting and dying in the fog. Even the Observer's Tower twisting and deforming in unnatural geometry. It all feels like a fever dream, turned into a blood-curdling nightmare, with a lonely man a little too ready for a fight, stuck in the middle of it all. The heaviest part though, easily, is Alion's attempted suicide by jumping off the roof of his tower, only for him to wake up back in his bed. This man's mind is at its breaking point, to the degree that he can't even identify himself or his own thoughts or memories anymore, but something still will not let him die. Whether it's the entity keeping him around for its own cruel entertainment, his own subconscious refusing to rest until his work is done, or something more otherworldly altogether is left ambiguous, which only serves to enhance the creeping sense of madness that pervades the story. Alion is no longer a static figure sitting in his chair, dowsing in the memories of other people, but a man truly at the cusp of insanity. And as he said himself in the first archive tome, the entity specialises in drawing men to the edge of despair, and then pushing them in. The Sanitas Alionis is of extremely high quality and massively enriches the character of the Observer, but there is one story in this archive tome that's even better. A Man Named Boy, starring Max Thompson Jr, better known as the Hillbilly, is possibly my favourite archive story of all time. Or at least, it's in contention with the Doctor's story, Ascendance, for the top spot. I've touched on the Hillbilly's lore before in the aforementioned Hag tome, where I acknowledged it as pretty good, and a solid standard for future killer lore to follow, but it always fell short of the really good lore, due to Billy's relative lack of depth. Oh, how a man named Boy changed that. And they did it with a very simple narrative device that allowed Billy to develop a strong personality, despite being totally deprived of all meaningful positive connection. One that we can see and understand as a whole person, more than the animal he could easily have been misconstrued as. His TV. The TV was nothing short of a stroke of genius. It is 
absolutely core to the whole basis of Billy's character in this story. It takes what could have been just a mindless beast turned to anger and rage by its mistreatment and changed it into a person capable of being understood and rooted for because it gave him perspective on his life. Billy is driven by anger, but not just because he was mistreated. Instead, he is angry because he was denied the sugar-coated and idealised world that the TV promised him. Because the one way he had to escape his dim four walls just served to remind him how bad his life was every time he turned it off. The Superman allegory he invokes is so fucking good because by showing a shining symbol of hope and justice, it just contrasts with Billy's own tortured existence and in many ways acts as a commentary on many of DBD's more tragic killers. In another life, a life where they were dealt better hands, people with their skills could have done great things and pushed humanity forwards been the supermen of their own times, or led good and fulfilling lives in other ways and been supermen to the ones they loved. But Dead by Daylight's world is a grim one, with very little hope left, and nobody knows this better than Max Thompson Jr. The stomach-churning violence as Billy played with the brains in his hands clashes with his childlike internal monologue as he accepts his role in the world. He didn't have the bright and optimistic upbringing of Superman or Beaver. He was kept in a cage and treated like a monster, a beast of burden who kills for the entertainment of others. He's come to terms with the fact that that's all he's ever going to be, and it's both tragic and incredibly cathartic as he picks off the crooked police one by one. In one way, it's an act of restorative justice, as he makes sure that they'll never hurt him or anyone else again in a way that feels earned. But in another way, he's just affirming Billy's fatalistic outlook, because it's all he's ever known, and he believes himself to be incapable of anything else. And it's sad to think that, as a killer in the Entity's service, that belief would only get stronger with every survivor that feels the bite of his chainsaw. If you haven't read A Man Named Boy yet, drop what you're doing and read it right now. The link to the wiki with all these stories in it is in the description. Okay, scratch that. Subscribe first, then go read the story. In summary, this tome was polarised. On one hand, you had the bitter disappointment of Rebel with a Cause, and the kind of jarring missed opportunity of Doors Unknown that didn't really seem to fit when you consider what could have been in its place. But the Sanitas Alionis and a man named Boy both knocked out of the park with high quality storytelling and deep character exploration, they kept up to scratch or even exceeded Dead by Daylight's gloomy atmosphere and predilection for violence and cruelty. Is this my favourite tome? Probably not. I think tome 2 is still my favourite. And when I go back and review the old tomes, I will get onto why. But tome 5 is definitely taking the number 2 spot on my personal tome tier list. So now I'd like to ask you. What did you think of this tome and the stories in it? Was I too harsh, too generous? What would you like to see instead? Please do let me know your thoughts in the comments because I do value everyone's input and it's good to hear what you think. And do not forget to subscribe if you like this sort of content. And every single one means a lot to me. One more thing before I go. When I was reading Nia's story, I realised there's a burgeoning little community you've got going on here. It might be good to actually put our name to something. Something that matters a bit more than Dead by Daylight lore. The El Hiblu 3 are a group of three Libyan teenagers, currently facing a life sentence in Malta for the crime of trying to save the lives of their fellow countrymen. Please, if you have time, take a look at their story and put your name to Amnesty International's demands to have them freed. It's a small thing, but it would mean a lot to me if you could do it. The link is in the description. That's all from me for now. I'm the Law Guy here at Pixelbush Entertainment. Good night to you all.